So thank you, Mukaram, for the invitation. Uh, I'm excited to be uh, with you all at the RICO Center today uh, to talk about two ideas. Uh, the first is the global consensus protocol, and the second is the local storage engine. So when we talk about these two ideas, it's often in isolation. Uh, so the distributed systems community will talk about consensus and uh, you know, use time replication, Paxos Raft. The storage community will talk about storage engines. And today I wanna to talk about both um, to show you how to remix them into a new distributed database design. So if you're starting today, you wanna to build a distributed database, you know, all the research that's come along especially you know, 2018, um, what do we really want to do? How, 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 do you, how do we build distributed databases today? What's changed? Uh, so I want to do this at a high level, uh, looking at the 2012 Houston Replication Revisited paper from MIT, as well as the 2018 Protocol Aware Recovery for Consensus-Based Storage from UW-Madison. Um, if you ever want to learn anything about storage systems, file systems, databases, anything to do with storage, UW-Madison, just check out all the research coming from Ramsey, Andrea, Apache Duso, go to the FAST conference, just attend that FAST conference and you'll really get some of the best research coming out. Anything from UW-Madison is just fantastic. Uh, but protocol aware recovery is like one of the diamonds. Uh, but it's not gonna be your typical paper presentation today. I wanna focus on the two big ideas from these papers, uh, fill in some of the interesting backstory around the papers how they fit together in the rest of the space, uh, present this in the context of how we implemented the papers for Tiger Beetle, what we learned from that. And I hope that before the hour is up, uh, we'll see a new future open up, uh, looking beyond popular consensus implementations of Paxos and Raft and beyond existing storage engines like LevelDB and RocksDB. And I'm excited for our Q&A together at that point. So before we dive in, let me introduce the context, tell a story, which like a lot of technology is all about the web. Uh, my name is Yoran. I work as a staff engineer at COIL. Uh, like the founders of COIL, I was one of those programmers who grew up with the web. Uh, they called us Generation Y or the Millennials, uh, but we were really the web generation. So I remember uh, when I first read Roy Fielding uh, describing the beauty of HTTP. Uh, it turns out that when Roy wrote the RFC for HTTP, 1.1 1 .1 in 1997, along with Tim Berners-Lee and others, they understood uh, that the web would need not only a way to read and update resources, but also a way to pay for them. Uh, the good news was that in the RFC, they allocated HTTP status code 402 to mean payment required. And unfortunately, the bad news was that this code was reserved for future use. So it was never implemented by browsers, and that's because the open payments infrastructure just didn't exist. So the web grew up uh, with no way for the user agent to pay a website developer directly. And the web became overrun by ads, which have ruined the digital experience. So this is the problem that COIL, um, where I work, this is what we're solving. Um, and this is just a way for a website developer to get paid directly by their users, directly through the browser. As a developer, you switch on web monetization, you add a, a meter tag to your HTML um, containing a simple URL called a payment pointer. And then as users browse your website, you receive micropayments streaming through a thin open interoperability protocol called Interledger. Um, the way to think about Interledger, it's like internet protocol for payments. So you send a payment around the world instantly from any wallet to anyone, no matter who they bank with, no matter the currency. So Interledger connects all the payment systems, the old systems, the new systems, everything. It doesn't, it's, it's exactly like internet protocol like that. It's a thin interoperability glue layer between different kinds of innovations. Some of them are old, some are new. It, it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can try out new stuff, but everybody can talk to each other the way the internet is. It's, internet's like a network of networks and it's an open network. So Interledger is kind of the first for payments where we can finally have an open network of payment networks, all the systems. Uh, so some Interledger gateways already process a thousand micropayments per second. And at this scale, uh, we saw generic databases hit the wall uh, at around a thousand transactions per second as Relox block updates to the same account. So the nature of payments is to uh, debit many accounts on one side, but credit only a handful of accounts on the other, which means that, you know, databases have this optimization called group commit, 
Uh, and that can't really fully amortize F-sync in this case, because half of the equation is there's a lot of contention on those few accounts. So our team also had experience working on all kinds of payment systems and switches, uh, different payment companies over the years, or studying accounting like myself. And we were seeing that everyone was always reinventing accounting. So we designed a financial accounting database called Tiger Beetle uh, to be really good at counting stuff out of the box, uh, counting anything really. Uh, so it's relevant not only to the world of payments, but also to things like pay per use APIs, cloud billing systems, anything where you want to just track usage or, or count stuff. Um, doesn't even have to be monetary counts. Um, and it's especially true that Tiger Beetle is good for these things because we designed it to count things at scale, uh, to process a million financial transactions per second. And that's two to three orders of magnitude more performance than the ad hoc systems that we were looking at in the payment space. Uh, so the first performance insight, I just wanna share a few insights just you know, along the way before we get into the, the two big ideas. I thought these might be interesting. Uh, the first performance insight here is that um, if you move the financial primitives or the business logic to the database, uh, you co-locate the balance tracking logic with the data rather than moving the data back and forth across the network. Uh, that's just much better to do. Uh, it's easy to move the code to the data. Moving the data to the code, you have to do it runtime and do it all the time, which is expensive. Uh, this also laid the foundation for a second insight, uh, which was to give database queries a first class batching interface. So you can amortize network communication, F-sync context switches and execute around 10,000 transactions in a single database query. The way we think about database interfaces before is like you, you do one thing in one query. Um, and often our query language is not really meant for many things in one query. But I think the right way to think of interfaces is that everything is a batch. And then the question is, well, is it a batch of one or 10,000? And if your interface supports batching as a first class primitive, um, it's really, really good for working with hardware. Uh, so these were the big wins, uh, but then we got 10% here, another 10% there, things like IU ring, uh, IOU ring, direct IO, a zero copy fixed size data structures. Uh, so we can read data off the wire without deserialization, um, which you know you don't have any serialization, deserialization cost, which is huge. Uh, so everything in Tiger Beetle is aligned to a cache line. Uh, so there's no issues with false sharing and not wasting cache misses. Um, there are also a lot of constraints and limits like this, but they end up making the system super simple and fun. Uh, and it works well for hardware. So it also helps that Tiger Beetle is written in Andrew Kelly Zig, which I hear was founded at the Rico Center, or you know that was the, the geographical spot where the big ideas kicked in. Um, and Zig's type system is perfect uh, for enforcing you know, this kind of memory alignment, ensuring that all Tiger Beetle's memory is statically allocated at startup. Um, once Tiger Beetle starts up, we don't call malloc at all. No more malloc, no more free. Um, Zig's explicit like this. Uh, there's no hidden control flow uh, to bite you, um, no hidden allocations. We can handle memory allocation failure safely without crashing. Uh, it's a highly orthogonal language. That's what sets Zig apart from so many other languages. It's got a huge power to weight ratio. Uh, if you've heard of Zig's comp time, then I can tell you it's awesome. Uh, the standard lib is extremely well designed. Uh, the hash map, uh, the cryptography implementations are state of the art. Uh, Frank Denise from Libsodium is the on the Zig core team doing Zig's crypto. Um, I think it was one of the first crypto um, standard lib implementations to be formally um, checked. So like the quality in Zig is on another level. Like this language is obviously it's pre it's pre 0 0.1, um, but there's huge amounts of quality in Zig. Uh, it's pretty, it, it's a question. You know, sometimes we look at programming languages and we say. You know, quality, you know, quantity, you know, where, where are the hordes of programmers using it? But sometimes I think a better metric is quality. Uh, can you see the quality in the tool? If the tool is ridiculously good, use it, you know? Um, so yeah, again, with SIG, code is simple, readable. Compiler is really good. Um, compilation as a tool is really important. Um, so the choice also made sense because we realized two years ago um, that our production release was coming uh, it's actually coming later this year, and that would probably coincide with Zig reaching self-hosted. Uh, also because Tiger Beetle's control plane is single threaded. So, and again, we've got static memory allocation. Uh, we've got single threaded concurrency model, 
And then you can start to see that, well, we don't really need as much of the borrow checker. We don't, those are not, it's not our problem domain. We're not, we're not trying to be fearlessly multi-threaded, you know. Um, we're not worried about use after freeze because we never free. Uh, so Zig also has things like checked arithmetic enabled by default. Um, and that fits our safety story. Uh, here we follow NASA's power of 10 rules for developing safety critical code. Uh, for example, we don't allow, like I said, dynamic memory allocation. Throughout our consensus code, uh, Tiger Beetle averages six assertions per function. So it's a different approach to developing software, uh, but the team have come to love it. And I don't think any of us would ever go back to a world that doesn't check all function pre-post conditions. I really recommend this to you. If you, uh, on your next side project, anything that you code, as you write a function, take the function inputs and assert everything, everything that you possibly expect about them and assert everything that you don't expect. Um, the positive space, the negative space, just assert everything in your code base and you'll see straight away your, the quality of, of your code is, your, your velocity is actually gonna get faster. You'll be able to do more difficult problems. Um, you, you'll be able to tackle problems that you could never solve before, the most difficult problems. Um, this, this technique will make them accessible to you as a developer. Uh, this is like a leveling up to um, NASA's power of 10 rules and particularly assertions. Um, um, so, the, the, I, and I know this in my own experience, you know, I was, I was working on some problems in the past and I just couldn't tackle, I couldn't solve them. I had to, they failed, they failed, they failed. And finally getting into this style of coding that, that opened up new, new problem domains for me. Um, so finally, uh, we took the simple safe design, we made it distributed, highly available to ease the ops burden uh, with re replication on the primaries disk uh, plus a backups disk before acting to the client for durability. Uh, people run a lot of database systems and they say, well, we're just gonna have a single node um, and you know the client is gonna make a request, we'll write it to the database disk and then we'll act. But actually you just can't do that because what if you lose the database? And then people say, well, we'll have backup, but that's also not good enough because you know backups you take at a certain frequency, what happens if you take a backup you know, then you accept some data from the user and then you lose your database. So actually you have to have replication. Like, and if your database doesn't have that built in, then it's just huge burden on, on you as the developer. And your replication can't be async, uh, which is what a lot of the setups are. You have to have synchronous replication because otherwise you're losing user data. You don't have, you don't really have durability. So we realized that for Tiger Beetle, like we're gonna have to have a primary um, write to that disk, replicate it to a backup disk before we can act to the client for durability. Um, and this replication is optimal. I mean, like I said, it's required. Um, we need to store the transaction in at least two availability zones. Uh, the trick here though is if you blink, you'll see that this is actually a consensus protocol. Uh, it's not Paxos, not Raft, but Brian Oakey's vStamp replication. So we use vStamp replication or VSR as our global consensus protocol for strict serializability uh, plus Barbara Liskov, James Cowling's deterministic view change uh, from the 2012 revision of the VSR protocol. And the reason is, the big reason is that doesn't suffer from Raft's problem of tuning leaders. So VSR is like the best kept secret in the consensus community. Uh, it's the front runner ahead of Paxos and Raft in several respects, and not only in the chronology. So in fact, if you like Raft, uh, then you should really like VSR because Raft was introduced in 2014. And that was actually two years after James Cowling's VSR revision from MIT. So if you change some of the names, then Raft is almost identical, uh, just with a few concessions to make the paper maybe a bit easier. I'm not sure if it does for Raft. I, I actually find VSR is, is even easier to understand as a paper. Uh, but Raft does make some concessions that you should know. If you're going to implement Raft, you're actually giving up um, you, you're giving up some 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 a lot of ground. You know, if you are, as an engineer, I wouldn't want to give up that ground. Um, the implementations are just as difficult, but you know, why, 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 give, why give it up if you don't have to? So, so let's look at what that is. Uh, so here, yeah, the big difference is Raft still has a randomized leader election protocol. Um, th this means that the protocol has no defense against multiple followers racing to become leader. 
So these are followers, they see the leaders down, then they all you know, put themselves forward. Um, this can result in a split vote uh, where the leader election result has to be thrown away and redone. So that means Raft is slower to isolate the faulty primary. You know, the leader election is, is there to isolate the old primary and elect a new one. And Raft is slower to do that because sometimes it has to throw the whole result out. Um, to mitigate this, Raft makes another concession by adding randomized padding to the heartbeat timeout that each follower uses to detect a failed leader. So this means that each follower, you know, it's, it's, it's timeout is, is starting at different times. So it improves the odds that, that one of them will propose itself ahead of the others. But then, then this means that Raft is slower to detect faults. So, and VSR doesn't have any of these problems. So I'd like to dig a little into why I think that is. Um, so if you've read the 2012 paper for VSR, um, it has the deterministic view change. Um, and you may also have noticed that VSR has this crisp, elegant terminology. Um, that's because Barbara Liskov, the Turing Award winner, was involved in both the 88 and 2012 editions. So what you're reading is something that has decades of experience and thought. And it also sits alongside um, the other work that Barbara's team at MIT were doing at the same time. Uh, so this thinking around terminology is not accidental and it can actually guide you to get the implementation right in subtle but important ways. So let me give a few examples. So the first is surprising and easy to miss, but when we think of Paxos, we think of it as a consensus protocol. That's what it is, right? Paxos is consensus. Uh, well, it's a, a way to agree on a value in general and there are, of course, powerful advantages to Paxos as an abstract protocol like this. Um, and it also depends on your network topology. Um, you know, uh, but it does mean that for many consensus applications, Paxos can be difficult to implement because it's not exactly a replication protocol. Uh, whereas VSR describes itself not so much as a consensus protocol, which it is, but as a replication protocol, which it is as well. So it starts with the name, view stamp replication. Uh, you see Lamport's logical timestamp shining through with the happens before relationship. Uh, some people say that's the gateway drug into distributed systems, it was for me. Uh, but then with view stamp replication, you see these logical timestamps get combined with view numbers to form view stamps. Uh, we'll get into what those are, but it's a gentle learning curve. Um, you know, so you, you start with, with Lamport's logical timestamps plus this idea of a view stamp and well, then you've, you know, you've grokked view stamp replication. So plus VSR comes with context. So it shows you how to, have a, how to have a primary machine, how to do replication to backups, have a total order on operations, how to do failover, how to isolate the old primary and how to make one backup the new primary all with strict serializability. And this is exactly what we want. We actually want a replication protocol that also happens to include consensus. So that's what you get with VSR. Uh, Brian Oakey contributed all of this as part of his doctoral dissertation in 1988, a whole year before Paxos. And Brian said to me in an interview um, that we recorded that I was lucky enough to be able to do with him. Um, you can catch that on Tiger Beetle's YouTube channel, um, like your very own interview with Brian Oakey. There's also one with James Carling there. Um, but Brian said that he saw all these problems in the 80s and he just wanted to solve it. And it took everybody else, you know, like a long while to, to actually see, well, yeah, we should be doing replication of consensus and Brian's done all of this work for us. Um, so, you know, we were doing, you know, just manual failover, but I think Brian was a few decades ahead uh, because, um, you know, we, we've only now started to see that you have to have automated failover. Otherwise it's still gonna be consensus uh, but we're executing the algorithm manually as humans at 2 a.m. in the morning. Better just to code it in properly and test it. Um, so another example of terminology, uh, you might have noticed how Raf talks about leader election. And we always, I, I always thought about this, you know, it's all about leader election. When the leader fails, let's elect a new one. VSR talks about a view change. And that might seem surprising at first, um, and you might also still be wondering, okay, Raft is this problem of dueling leaders, but how does VSR's deterministic view change actually solve it? Well, if you're like me, um, like I said, I thought consensus was all about leader election. Uh, but the more I listen to Brian and James, the more I've come to realize that 
that's not really what consensus is all about. It's only half the problem and it's the easy half at that. So instead, I think a better way to think about consensus starts with these four words, isolate the old primary. If you can get the majority of a cluster to do this, you've solved the hardest part. So how do you isolate the old primary? The answer is Cowling and Liskov's deterministic view change. And here it is. So if you've only just brushed the VSR paper, you, we're gonna see on one slide, we're gonna understand consensus. Um, so first, every replica, a replica is just a machine in your cluster. You've got a cluster of five, you know, three or five. Each machine is called a replica because it replicates the data. It's got a copy of the data. So give each replica a U64 number. Every replica starts with their U64 number at zero. Then you make the primary a function of this number mod the number of replicas. That's your leader election right there. So uh, pretty easy, right? Uh, so you can now isolate the old primary. If you think the old primary is down, um, you've, you've detected a fault. Now you need to isolate the fault, the old primary, make sure the old primary can no longer be replicating. Um, otherwise you've got split brain. So we wanna isolate the old primary. You can do this. All you have to do is just ping a majority of replicas, send them a message, tell them to bump their numbers and act back to you. And once you know that a majority have bumped their numbers past the number that points to the, the primary, remember it's, you know, the number mod replicas, that's, that's what tells you the primary is. Once you know that they've done that, then you know you've isolated the old primary. Uh, so it's not usually presented like this, but at this point, your cluster also knows who the new primary is. Uh, and this completely sidesteps the problem of dueling leaders and with better latency. So it's also more resilient to all kinds of network faults uh, because this deterministic view change has the dice loaded ahead of time. There's more information that Liskov and Carling baked into the algorithm. It's a stronger distributed systems algorithm. It's not, Paxos and Raft have less information because they, they do it all random. Here we've actually, the designers of the protocol thought about a lot of this stuff and they put it in. It's just so much more powerful. And it's so easy to understand, you know, just numbers, everybody, mod, and that tells you who the primary is. Uh, you want to isolate the old primary well, you know, ping a majority of the cluster, tell them, okay, bump your number, then they're no longer going to see the, the, that old primary as primary. They, they will ignore messages from that primary. It's pretty easy. Um, uh, so that's why I think view change is a better term than only leader election, because it's broader. Uh, it's all about getting the majority of the replicas in the cluster to change their view, i.e. move them from seeing the old primary as primary to seeing the new primary as primary and to seeing themselves as backups. Uh, so one last example that has ramifications um, uh, is where Raft uses the terminology of RPC in the sense of a request from A to B with a response from B back to A. So this is kind of like HTTP request response. Raft uses that language. Um, however, again, the 2012 VSR, it will use a broader term of message passing. And it's a small, subtle difference between the papers. You know, you almost don't see this, but there's lots of these. If you compare the two papers, the Raft VSR paper, you'll start to see there's even more, 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 more differences. Um, and what, this is a huge impact because with VSR, you can do things like multi-path routing uh, where client A uh, sends a request message to the primary B. Primary B replicates or passes this message to the backup C. Then B fails. The cluster does a view change to isolate B as old primary and install C as the new primary. And then C just replies directly back to client A without A, you know, client A having to retry the request. That's what you get if you start talking about message passing versus request response, subtle shifts. And suddenly you start to think like Liskov is guiding you, like think of a message bus. All, all you need is for a replica to be able to send a message to replica zero or one or two, and to send a message to client with the 128 bit UUID. That's what you really need. You don't want IPv4 stuff leaking into your consensus protocol. You wanna abstract that, have a message bus do message passing. It's like Erlang or you know, distributed systems. It's, it's a much better way to think. 
um, and implement it. So it's it's more fun, it's easier. Um, so VSR and what you can do with it is biodigital jazz. Um, there's all kinds of cool tricks you can do also just with the deterministic view change. So some more examples, uh, you can use Heidi Howard's flexible quorums, run a cluster of four replicas. Conventional wisdom says, right, you've always got to run three or five um, replicas in your cluster, right? Well, that's actually wrong. The, the most efficient cluster sizes are now even numbers, thanks to Heidi Howard's flexible quorums research. So a cluster of four is 20% cheaper than a cluster of five. It has the same write availability. Um, and then you can use your future knowledge of who the next primary will be to optimize for synchro synchronous replication to go there. And then you can have async replication in the background to the rest of the cluster. So even how you do your split, you know, how, how what's the bare minimum of backups to replicate to synchronously? Um, you, you can split between that and, and async replication to catch up the others later. And then you can direct those of who the next primary will be. And you can do that all in terms of flexible quorums. All these things interact and they, they really fall out nicely. Um, in the same way, you can also blend ring and star network topologies. So a star topology is what everybody normally does. So the primary will replicate to all the backups. The problem with that is you've then divided your NIC uh, your, you know, your, net, your network interface, you've divided that bandwidth by the number of, of backups. So if your system is high throughput like Tiger Beetle, you can't actually afford to divide your leader's NIC into four. Um, it, that's too expensive. And that's one of the common fallacies of distributed systems. People assume that bandwidth is, is free. And people talk about what's the latency of the view change or raft. But a better question is, well, what's the bandwidth? You know? Um, because you can't just blindly replicate to everybody in parallel. It doesn't work work like that in practice, in engineering, you know? <laughs> and it's amazing. Like I chat to people and they just say, well, you'll get better latency with a star topology. But this is not, not practical because um, you just don't have that bandwidth if, you're, if your NIC is one gigabit a second. Um, so you, what you, what's better is when you start to blend your star topology with a ring topology. Ring topology can be brittle and fragile because that means you've got your cluster like this, primary replicates to the next backup. That will use its own NIC to replicate to the next one and so on and so on. Then they all send the small little ACK packets. Those can all go direct to the primary. That's again, another advantage with message passing is that you can have your big, your big replication messages. They can be like one meg. They're all going serial you know, through the ring, but you've got your ACK packets going straight back which is great for latency. And now, now what you've got is the best of, because chain, this is chain replication. Chain replication is, is optimal for throughput. You get very high throughput, uh, but you've blended. Chain replication doesn't have consensus. It's got no way to rearrange topology as the chain links fail, but you have that in consensus. Um, so you can start to do a mix where your primary is going to optimize synchronous replication to the next primary because your view change is deterministic. Uh, you maybe also want to do plus one in case the next primary does is down and doesn't act. So you've got a bit of like proactive tail latency tolerance, but then you've got this nice thing, what we call a Ringo star topology, um, which is great throughput and, and decent latency. Failover is always happening to the right. So, or yeah, this way, so that you know you can lay your cluster out like that. You also get a nice mental model, again, all from the nice deterministic view change. So of course, not everything is perfect in the 2012 paper. There are two minor correctness bugs, actually. Um, they're on the fringes of the paper. So Dan Port's team at the University of Washington, um, they found a correctness bug in the recovery protocol. Um, we they also gave a solution to that, um, and we found another correctness bug in the client crash recovery protocol. Um, so we've solved both of these for Tiger Beetles VSR. Uh, if you ever need the details, drop me an email. I'll fill you in. Um, and again, like Raft and VSR, Raft is the same as VSR, and the authors of Raft were aware of VSR. You'll see they sort of talk about this in the Raft paper, um, but actually Raft is almost identical to VSR. They've just, they've just done away, well, they, they didn't inherit the deterministic view change, which is unfortunate. Um, there, there's decisions, the reasons for that in the paper, but I think if you're actually implementing this, 
then you, you definitely want the deterministic view change. Um, you also don't, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it later. Um, you raft is this thing where it only elects a primary if the primary has a pristine log. There's actually a, a, a very good reason why that's not a good idea in practice where we'll get to that. Um, so at the same time, uh, Tiger Beetle is also perhaps the first distributed database to run a consensus bug bounty. It's called ViewStamp Replication Made Famous because that's the one thing that ViewStamp Replication isn't. It's a practical paper. It's easy to make live. Uh, it's simple. It's everything that people have been trying to do for Paxos. Uh, so that's the joke, uh, but it isn't as famous. Uh, but what we'll do is if you can find a way to break Tiger Beetle or find a correctness bug, uh, we'll award up to $8,192. Um, if you can find a way just to trigger an overtight assertion, and there's about a thousand of them in the consensus implementation, find a way just to crash one of those, and you can earn between $1,000 and $2,048. Uh, $2, um, but the biggest win for why uh, VSR is a better foundation for replication and consensus, I think, is that proofs for Paxos and Raft, they often assume a world of perfect storage. Things are too neatly delineated. They say, well, you know, we're a non-Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus protocol. But the real world isn't like that. You know, sure, your network fault model is Byzantine. Um, and sure, your CPU, um, your, you know, your computing fault model, that is non-Byzantine. But they assume that the disk is non-Byzantine. And that's not correct uh, because disks are faulty. You can't, you can't just do a formal proof, but assume that the disk is going to be perfect <laughs> and then say, well, it's formally proven. Um, and because that, that, that doesn't help us as engineers, you know, we, how, how do you work with faulty disks? Um, and, and there's a gap there. Um, so these protocols, they're correct for the network fault model, uh, but they fork the log when exposed to storage faults. And I, that's where I feel that VSR's instincts are much better. Uh, because Brian made the protocol almost completely in memory. And then uh, Barbara and James took this all the way. Uh, so you can run the whole protocol without stable storage. That's a huge difference, you know, just to be able to start out implementing consensus, not worry about disk faults. Because it's really difficult, you know, just to try and write something to disk, you'll, you'll see Dan Liu has written some fantastic blog posts. How hard is it really to write something to the file system is extremely hard. And trying to do consensus at the same time is just is a nightmare. So here you've got a consensus protocol where it's all like levitating, you know, it's off, off the disk. It's like a, a hovercraft, you know, you're floating above, above all the tricky surface area. Um, so obviously, I mean, in the labs, people are running Paxos in memory as well. Um, but just typically, you know, they, they assume stable storage. Um, so we, we actually run VSR with stable storage for Tiger Beetle, um, but we've also got a clearly defined storage fault model. Um, so again, if you believe that disks are not perfect, uh, that sectors fail, rot, or become slow, then the best way to make distributed systems reliable is just to place less demands on stable storage for correctness. And this is what I think uh, I like to call this near Byzantine fault tolerance. So you don't, you don't have the massive resource cost of a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol because those those need higher levels of redundancy you know to solve for bad actors we and and in production systems you don't that can be overkill so we don't need that at the same time just saying well non-Byzantine fault tolerance well that's not something we can implement uh, in a real world system it's not safe uh, so something in between is near Byzantine fault tolerance and that's where your network is is Byzantine, you know, stuff can get messed with. Um, computing is, is reliable, memory is reliable, disk is almost Byzantine. The disk can mess with your data. And if you think of it like that, then, then you'll have something you, you, that's really resource efficient. You don't need a lot, you know, you can deploy a cluster, a cluster of four or five, um, but you're gonna have very, very high, um, safety and reliability. So yeah, so Tiger Beetle's consensus is designed to survive radioactive levels of corruption across all replicas, even the leader, and to have tail tolerance for noisy neighbors in the cloud uh, with P100 latency of 10 milliseconds per 10,000 transactions. So in the cloud, the biggest challenge is, is not that stuff cleanly fails, um, but that it fails slow. You know, you have these components where the disk suddenly starts two seconds 
it, it takes two seconds to execute a write. Um, and when you design these kinds of protocols, you actually need to build in tail tolerance to work around it. And again, you can do this really nicely with the deterministic view change or all of the stuff you can start to, and with message passing, you know, because now you, you having uh, replicas replicate and they're sending X in parallel to the, the primary, the primary can move forward, um, work around slow disks. It doesn't even need stuff to be on its own disk and it can already start to, to commit the operation. Um, so the architecture for Tiger Beetle is a pure fault tolerant function. So just think of a programming function and it's gonna be fault tolerant and it's a pure function. What that means is you give it inputs, uh, it takes the state, applies the inputs and you get a new state. And the, obviously the inputs are applied in the same order. So that's a replicated state machine, but it's just a programming function where you, you call it with the same, you know, you call it with the old state with a, with a new input and you always are giving it the inputs in the same order. Then you can be sure that every replica is gonna to get to the same result or state. Um, um, so, you, so you have a replicated log on disk. Um, the primary appends to the log um, as requests come in. And then we run the requests in the log through our state machine function, and we get to the same in-memory state across the cluster. Um, and here I want to get, we sort of moving in the murky area between consensus protocol and storage engine, because you'll see, you know, in the consensus papers, they just say, well, at some point, your, your log that the consensus protocol gives you, you know, your totally ordered log, at some point you want to snapshot that, and, and then you're just going to take your in-memory state and dump it to disk. And that's what like Redis will do, right? Redis has got all this in-memory state. And at some point it's gonna call snapshot and write that to disk. But if you've got gigabytes, that snapshot, you know, that can take like a long, long time. And in the consensus literature, they say, well, just you're gonna snapshot. And, but, but now how do you do a snapshot that's gonna take 15 minutes, you know, and, and must you let clients wait for 15 minutes until the snapshot completes and then you can start to ex execute new requests. So, um, you know, we can't let the log go on forever. Startup times would suffer. At the same time, we need to snapshot our in-memory state to disk, uh, and that can take really long. So the snapshotting has to be incremental. Um, and that's where it's murky because we're in between um, consensus and storage engines. Um, and also for performance, we don't want random writes. Um, so this is how we're gonna solve this problem now. Um, incremental snapshotting for the write path. Um, so step one, uh, again, back to the consensus log, requests get appended to the log. Step two, the requests get executed in order. And as a request gets executed, it's going to generate key value inserts or updates. Just think of it like that. You know, it's a key value store and you've got inserts or updates against it. Uh, as, as you execute a request, it's going to trigger, you know, some state changes. State changes are just key value inserts or updates. And but what we're going to do is now these key value inserts updates, we're going to add them to like a four meg in memory buffer. And then step three, when this buffer fills up, we're going to sort the key values in it and then just dump it to disk as a table. That's now a four meg write to disk. That's not going to take too long. Uh, then we rinse and repeat. We create lots of sorted tables on disk. And when the log needs to wrap, all we need to do now is just write out a manifest uh, which is just another way of saying it's just a list of the tables on disk. So when you want a checkpoint, when you want to let your log wrap around, because your log is just a circular buffer on disk, when you want to start to overwrite you know, existing log entries, all you do is you just write out a manifest of you know, your, your tables that you have dumped to disk. Um, and then you can replay the log from there at startup. Um, so with the write path solved, how do we solve the read path? How do we read state that's too big to fit in memory while it's being incrementally snapshotted? Uh, so first, we check if the in-memory buffer, does it have the key? Otherwise, we go to our manifest. It's like a directly list, directory listing of tables on disk. And we basically see what's the newest table. Does that have the key? If it does, we bind research in the table for the value. Remember, tables are just sorted values. That's it. Um, if we don't find it in the newest table, or we go back in time until we find a table that does. And obviously now we might have a lot of tables. So at some point we wanna start compacting, you know, merging tables that, together um, so that we, 
and then we create new tables out of them. But that way we, we limit the number of overlapping tables as there's fragmentation. So everything's append only. And this is also great for performance because all your write IO is sequential. But it also means that crash recovery is simple. Uh, everything is copy and write. We're never updating in place. So if your system crashes, you don't have to worry. You just replay the log from where you last checkpointed and you'll just redo all the compaction work again. Um, tables only get added to the manifest once they're on disk. Um, so your, your crash recovery is really simple. Um, there are also no locks. So readers can read while a writer writes and you straight away, you've got multi-version concurrency control. Um, and you can now also do range queries. And this is just where you want to get all keys within a range. And that can be a great foundation for building database indexes on top. Um, so we started out wanting incremental snapshots of our consensus log. And from first principles, we've actually arrived at an LSM tree or log structured merge tree. And this is Tiger Beetle's local storage engine. Um, so there's the consensus log. This builds an in-memory buffer, you know, with the, the inserts and updates. Eventually, this gets flushed to disk as a sorted table. Reads check the tables from newest to oldest. You get nice range queries, nice snapshots of the database any point in time. And as you saw from the Hydrat Boy talk, if, if you watched it, uh, like I said, you know, LS entries are everywhere. Um, they're taking over. A lot of databases are moving to them as their storage engine because you get key value storage. You also get, you know, range queries, which you also need. Um, uh, so the most popular you know, LSMs are LevelDB, RocksDB, and they've got a lot of industry use, uh, 10 years in the industry, almost exactly, you know, from RocksDB was born in, in May, 10 years ago. Um, so why would we write a new LSM tree for Tiger Beetle? And the answer is bringing these two big ideas together, global consensus protocol, local storage engine. We've got to bring them together, and I'm going to motivate why now. Um, but Firstly, just to say, you know, after seeing, uh, after experiencing VSR's deterministic view change, after seeing how powerful determinism can be as a principle, uh, we've come to see that the future of, of everything, you know, for databases is deterministic. Uh, so we also care deeply about storage faults and memory efficiency. So the answer, you know, why do a new storage engine for Tiger Beetle? The answer is threefold. Um, everything is deterministic. Plus, storage faults, we care about them, durability, plus um, memory efficiency and all kinds of efficiency. So the impact is huge. And I just want to, you know, give you a few of these reasons, you know, or benefits. So what if you could run your distributed database as a pure simulation? You can run it on your dev machine. It's a single binary and there's no Docker. So you can speed up time and you can basically train like they do in the matrix, you know, like Morpheus and Neo. Um, you just do fault injection simulations. Um, you, you can simulate different latencies for your network, different latencies for your storage. Um, you can do fault injection and all of this is coming from a single seed. So where correctness bugs in your consensus are automatically detected by your simulator and where you can replay bugs as you switch on debug logs or hook up a debugger. So inspired by Foundation DB, uh, Tiger Beetle is a deterministic distributed database. So just being a distributed database these days is no longer enough. It has to be deterministic. That's like really where things are going and Foundation DB showed that. Um, so you can run Tiger Beetle in a simulator called the Vopper. And the Vopper took two weeks to build. It's like an easy thing to build, but it's a powerful idea. Um, and it helped find and fix 30 distributed bugs in just three weeks. Um, normally, these kinds of bugs would take months to debug, to, to you know, triangulate, to reproduce them. Uh, because if, if your database is not deterministic, you can't reproduce bugs deterministically. Suddenly, now it becomes a huge pain. Uh, but if you make your whole design deterministic, you can now run it in a simulator. Um, and you can just, yeah, the, the velocity is insane. I've never had such a high... You know, as uh, uh, myself and another engineer, we, we, to us, it was just felt like magic to be able to get this kind of velocity. So you can think of it like Jepson and then just 10x Jepson, you know, like hit Jepson out of the park, where it's, a, it's a, like this is Foundation DB. So Carl Kingsbury said, you know, he, he didn't dare to test um, Foundation 
because he said just well their their test suite is just on a totally different level uh, because it's deterministic. Um, so the other difference with you know is that this kind of simulation you can now because you control the world you can actually detect consensus violations the instant they take place. You don't have to capture the whole history and then try and you know solve for correctness afterwards, which is very compute you know intensive. You can there's much better ways to detect consensus violations if you have a pure simulation like this. Um, you can also um, uh, speed up relative execution time. So Jepson has to run in real time. So if you want to find a bug that takes years to find, you have to run Jepson for years. You know if I understand correctly. Um, with these new kinds of simulation techniques, you can speed up time. You literally have a, you just, you know, tick, tick, um, tick your seconds in a while loop. Um, and that, that's how you get to a bug that will take two years to manifest. Um, you can do this with a simulation where you can simulate the passing of time. Um, and again, it's all deterministic. So when you do find something interesting, you will just get a little number called a seed. And you can drop that seed in your Slack channel, you know, with your developer team. And as you go to bed, someone else in the US is going to carry on working on that seed and solve it the next morning. You don't, you don't even have to, I mean, that that is enough. Sharing that seed shares the whole environment, you know, the, the characteristics of the network at the time, because you can have different kinds of networks, different kinds of storage environments. All of that can be shared with a single number. So that just gives you this magical test velocity. That's why we wanted our storage engine to be deterministic. Otherwise, we would lose this. Uh, so we wanted to reproduce bugs instantly from a seed, uh, but most LSM trees were not designed for this. They're not deterministic, like level DB, rocks DB. There's you know random thread scheduling, all kinds of stuff. The way they do compaction, the whole it, the, the, this idea from Foundation DB of determinism, it, it wasn't there when they were building these these engines ten years ago. Um, so just to show you, you know, these are the kinds of network faults that this, this is our simulator. Um, that we call it the Vopper. If you've watched war games, then you'll know why, why it's called the Vopper. Uh, but Vopper stands for View Stamped Operation Replicator. Um, and uh, the, this is what it can do for network. It's basically like simulating different network weather. Um, and so Jepson, as far as I understand, doesn't do storage fault injection. Um, it, you know, we assume stable storage is pristine, right? Um, but the VAPA can inject up to 30% uh, stable storage corruption on every replica. So Raft can't elect a leader if the leader has a single storage fault. Uh, but what you can do with VSR, and, and we'll get to another protocol, you can actually have corruption happening across the whole cluster simultaneously. So you can start to think of your consensus log as, as these arrays, you know, um, new ops get added to the top. And here you've got your cluster of four. They've all got an array going down. You add the same up at the same up. But now you've got you've got you've got your ops replicated, right? Which means that if you implement this correctly, you should be able to say, well, you know, this up there is faulty, but we have it here. This up here is faulty, but we have it here. And so on. You can start to like spiral your faults across your, and so long as you can always merge your arrays and have some kind of quorum. The, the quorum can rotate um, and you should still be fine. You should still be able to you know, elect a new primary. And that's where I feel like Raft kind of you sacrifice that. Raft becomes, you lose your cluster in Raft much sooner. Raft doesn't maximize the replication durability. Um, so yeah, so again, like it's just magic if you can handle these kinds of storage faults so much. Uh, yeah, that's the quorum intersection property. But the trick is that that should be able to rotate. You know, it, you don't you don't need the, this requirement that the leader, the new leader, must have a pristine log. That's why should we? It, it, it's not. It doesn't. It's pretty easy to solve that in practice. We don't really gain much understanding or simplicity by sacrificing that property. So I think it's something to hold on to. You know, um, and here's the crux. Um, the, the consensus protocol can only handle this extreme form of fault injection um, only because of research that came out in 2018. So that's this paper. This paper is like the diamond paper from UW Medicine. It won best paper at FAST 2018. And if you're designing a distributed database, the question is, well, 
is your database designed for this paper or not? You know, was your database designed pre-2018? Most of the di distributed databases out there will all fail the analysis of this paper. Um, they, they, they can actually have you know, global data loss across the cluster, or they will become um, unavailable prematurely. And what this paper says is that we can no longer talk about the two ideas in isolation. We can't talk consensus protocol and storage engine. We have to integrate the two. Um, they have to both, the local storage engine has to be aware that it's in the context of a distributed database. And that's why it's so actually, you can no longer just drop level DB and rocks DB into your distributed database uh, because the log there is not gonna be aware and not gonna be able to solve the challenges that you need to be able to solve in terms of this paper. So I, I won't go into all the details, the paper does that really well. Um, but that's why you, you actually, for correctness, you can't just drop in a, a local storage engine. Your local storage engine has to be aware of global consensus and vice versa. Global consensus has to be aware of local storage engine. They both have to share that right ahead log, be able to work with it and recover from it in different ways. So we have to talk about both. And this is critical for durability correctness. It's the only way to solve our fault model. And we're coming into land now for Q&A, but I just wanna show you two, two scenarios, right? This is the easy one. This is where you have power loss and you know obviously your primary is appending to the log, then, then you lose power. So obviously the last entry in your log is corrupt. So you come back up after a crash and you see, oh, that's a checksum failure. We'll just truncate the log at that point. That's what everybody does, right? Um, how about this one? We come back up, we see, oh, that's a checksum failure. That was a crash. Let's just tr truncate the rest of the log. Can you see the bug there? And this is what most databases do today still. Um, and I think I, I, uh, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, as far as I understand, there's very, very few systems that actually handle this correctly. And the reason why is because to fix this, the, to solve this problem, you have to be able to detect, you have to distinguish between crashes, which cause torn writes from but just bit rot in the middle of the committed log. You know, so this is like, this is like ops in your log that you've committed already, you've acted them to the client. You're not free to truncate them. Um, and what happens is that over the course of time, a disk sector becomes corrupt. Now in the middle of your committed log, you've got this corruption. You can't truncate the log there. You can't just erase committed entries because that'll cause your, your quorum across the cluster to swing. You know, so before you had the quorum intersection property, you know that you had something replicated across a majority. If it turns out that that majority is no longer a majority, your durability is undermined. Your consensus protocol will, can now suddenly erase all the data in your cluster, just like that. It, and, and this is possible if you have even a single corrupt sector on a single replica. So the protocol aware paper will show scenarios where and they, they evaluated real world systems like Log Cabin, which was the prototype raft, Zookeeper, lots of other systems. And they, all they, they, they found that they inject one disk sector fault and that destroys the whole, you know, all the data across the whole cluster. And how can that happen? You know, but it does happen. Um, so the way to solve this problem, you have to actually change the whole design of your write ahead log. Instead of having a single circular buffer on disk, you have to have two circular buffers. You have to start storing information out of band so that you can you know, distinguish between a simple crash and just you know, ordinary bit trot. Um, and then of course you can have misdirected or lost reads and writes and very few systems handle these faults. Like I said, most, most will lose data or shut down prematurely. Um, and yeah, uh, also some of them, they don't maximize availability. So like, like I said, you know, with Raft, Raft will shut down far sooner when in fact your cluster could just repair and you can have 30% corruption across all your replicas. You should still be able to keep going, uh, but a lot of these systems will just shut down. So you're not really getting, you know, value for money. You, you're paying for like four-way replication, but you're not you're only getting three-way replication. Um, so that's not so great. Uh, so to, to really maximize availability, you need something called a NAC protocol, which also is from the protocol aware paper. And basically that's just a way that 
as your new primary comes, comes up, it needs to be able to figure out, it'll say, okay, right, I see this op is corrupt on my disk. Now I wanna know, can I get this corrupt op from someone else? Okay, I can't get it from anybody else. Now we have to shut down. Unless with a NAC protocol, this new primary can say, hey guys, um, did you ever have this op? And if you can get enough of the cluster to say, well, I never saw this op, then actually you know that this op could never have been committed. And if you know that it could never have been committed, it's safe at that point to truncate the log. And then you can actually become, you can be available like in these extremely challenging you know, scenarios uh, where otherwise a lot, of, a lot of systems would just shut down. And this protocol is not difficult to implement. Like in Tiger Beetle, it's about a hundred lines of code. Uh, so, and with Raft, Raft is mutually exclusive to this protocol because Raft says, well, you never repair the leader's log because the leader's log is pristine. But uh, I, again, you know, if you, if you ever implementing consensus, don't just assume that you must implement Raft, like actually check out the literature and figure out what do you want to engineer? Because whatever you engineer is going to be extremely challenging. It's very difficult to implement this. But if you design your system deterministically, you know, bringing in these ideas, you, you'll have like superpowers, uh, assertions, you'll be able to get this stuff correct. Um, and yeah, run it in a simulator is just really, really powerful. Um, yeah, so again, we've got to talk about both ideas, you know, in the same breath. Um, you know, our formal consensus proofs, they ignored the storage faults in the storage engine. And our storage engines, they weren't designed to run within distributed databases. So I hope I've inspired you to get excited about a future uh, where these things are better integrated and more deterministic.